How's it going, Song of Ice and Fire fans? It's Grant from Yeet Cats Miniatures here, bringing you the first in a brand new series of Faction Overview. And today, we're looking at House Stark. I've got a very special guest with me today, Psycho Steve. I've known Psycho Steve quite a while now. We've crossed paths quite a few times in the tournament scene, and he's always been playing House Stark. Whether that's when they've been top ranked or low ranked, he's always had House Stark on the table. So I think he's exactly the person to come in and do these videos with me. Please keep your ears to the ground. I will be releasing some more of these over the coming months. I want to try and get all of the faction overviews done quite quickly so you've all got them to reference. The new players can sort of dip in and have a look at how these experts are potentially using their armies. And to give maybe the veterans a, a little look at how other people are using the house. So without further ado, let's crack on. House Stark with Stephen Connor. I'm going to jump on that call right now. How's it going, Song of Ice and Fire fans? It's Grant from UCATS Miniatures, and today I'm bringing you the newest in our Series 4 uh, Faction Breakdowns, where we invite a special person in that is both experienced and, uh, and in love with the faction we're talking about. So today we're going to be talking about the most northern and most proud of all the houses, House Stark. And I've got a very special guest with me today, Psycho Steve, Stephen Connor, from the... Borders of the Northwest. So how are you doing, Steve? Hiya, thank you for having me. Hey, welcome, mate. Welcome. How are you doing? I am very well, thank you very much. Uh, how about yourself? Yeah, in there. I'm loving the season four update, man. I can't wait. And House Stark is one of my, one of my most favourite uh, factions. So I can't wait to sort of talk to you about this. You know, I can almost forgive you for beating me at um, LGT a couple of years ago. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that was uh, that was good. I was nervous yeah. about playing you Targaryen that day, wasn't I? Queen of Marine. But do you want to give us a little rundown about how long you've been playing, why you love Starks and what you've won and et cetera, et cetera, all that sort of stuff? Yeah. Um, well, as you know, my name's Stephen, Psycho Steve from the Wardens of the North West. I've been playing Song for about four years now and Stark, as you most of you know, is my favourite faction. I have dipped my toe into other factions like Targaryens and Boltons, but um, obviously I always go back to Starks, always go back to the one you love. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've won a few tournaments, uh, like Northampton, Leeds and stuff like that, but never, ever have I won a tournament with Starks, which is very surprising. But I have won Best in Faction. As far as I can remember, every time I've been to a tournament with Starks, I've been Best in Faction apart from one time, and that was the last LGT. And I, but I blame that on illness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a pes pesky Boltons, mate. That's, that's what that was. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, man, so what I'll do is, well, before we start getting, getting right into these units, can you just give me a, a quick of the Stark play, play style and their faction identity? Yeah, well, me personally, I think the Starks are an awesome faction, as you know. Um, I think the play style is very aggressive, and it has loads of little combos, and they are very manoeuvrable as well with some of the um, units they have. They have some of the hardest hitting units in the game. And I also think the faction is simple for beginners with easy triggers on the units and cards to understand. All right, yeah. All right, so let's get stuck into the units then. So up on screen now, we have the Stark Swan Saw. So these are your basic House Stark units. Uh, they come in at five points. They're a movement five. They've got a 754 attack pro profile, hitting a four plus. They've got a four plus armor save and a six plus morale. Their attack profile is Winter's Bite, which is critical blow. If this unit has one or more destroyed ranks, it gains plus one to hit. And if this unit has two destroyed ranks, it may re-roll any attack dice. So we do see quite a few of these on the battlefield because Stark Swarm Souls are, I think, one of the, genuinely one of the best five point units. But can you talk a little bit about the Stark Swarm Swords? Yeah, I think also think they're a very good unit myself. Trip blows are good uh, abilities to have if you can roll the fixes, of course. Um, it's it's a good defensive for four up uh, defense. So you want to have that. Got to get them in the sweet spot as like two ranks. If you can get Caitlyn on them as well, which is highest attack dice, and you get your plus one to hit, so they go down to uh, three plus to hit on seven dice if you've got Caitlyn on them. They're a good unit to have. Five points, like you said, and there's loads of different attachments you can put in them to make them stronger. And you can, they are good for holding objectives, keeping in con combat. I think all, overall they're all around good Unit. So that's the first of the five point units. Stark have access to quite, you know, quite a, a vast range of, of five point units. The second being 
the House Karstark Lawless, which are on the screen now, who have just seen a, a buff in Season 4. Um, for five points now, I think these are quite quite a shining unit. So they are movement five. They have a 754 attack profile, hitting on a four plus. They've got a four plus armor save and a six plus morale. They come with the rules Ferocious Assault. Enemies successfully charged by this unit become panicked. They have Flow, which is vicious. Then they have Unleashed Ferocity. Each time this unit performs a melee attack, before rolling an attack dice, target the defender. For each of this unit's destroyed ranks, the defender becomes panicked or vulnerable. Um, I quite like that as a five point unit. Do you, have you had a chance to play these yet? I have used them once already since the um, update, and I found them really good. I put an attachment in them. Um, I put Ramsey Bolton in them with a uh, fuel by slaughter and with his intimidating presence. The vicious and being able to put panic on them, as well with Reek being able to put panic on them. The uh, they were quite solid to be honest. And even when you went down ranks, you'd build back up again. But being able to put condition tokens out can be a big thing and depend on game modes. If I think overall for five points, it's another good unit. Yeah. Would you do you think that they're comparable to Stark Swan Souls? Do they serve a different role for you or I think it depends on what faction you're playing against. Um I mean if you've got two different lists when you go to a tournament, this one has the has vicious, which is good for panic tests, and there are some factions that are, are terrible for panic. Um but like Cripplo with the other one, um it's good for units that have got low armor. To be honest, I think they are a good good unit. They have lost the ability to heal one every time you attack, but I think uh, being able to put, like I said, punk condition tokens on and getting vicious now, I think it is a good buff. Yeah, I think so. I agree. I totally agree with that. Um, I've not actually managed to play them yet in Season 4, but I'm really looking forward to getting them on the table. Um, next up, we have the House Cast Dark Spearman. Now, I think this was a really good change down to five points because, first and foremost, the miniatures are absolutely stunning for these and i love and i just I always found it quite a shame i didn't see them on the table quite as much as i felt they deserved so they've got a they're a five point unit as i said they've got a movement of five they've got a four plus to hit with a seven seven four attack profile as we come to expect from a spear unit they have a four plus armor save a six plus morale they come with the order hold the line when this unit activates target one enemy engaged with this unit it suffers two hits plus one hit for each of this unit's remaining ranks and it also comes with a defensive ability, Stand Your Ground. Each time an enemy performs a melee attack on this unit, if this unit is only engaged with one enemy, that enemy does not gain charge, flank, or rear bonuses. So I really like this this um, this unit on card. Um, are they as good as I think they are, or am I or am I looking through rose-tinted glasses? Well, I have played these in every list I've played so far this year. It's the update, sorry. And they are a very good unit. Um, they are very defensive which is what you want. They're also, if you're engaged, like you said, with the hold the line, that can be a game changer, especially with units that have got low armor, being able to, to hold the line as your order when you activate, and then as your action, depending on the situation and everything that's on the board, you could either attack or you could retreat with them, which is, which is good. or if you actually kill a unit with hold the line, you can charge another unit if possible or march forward. So I think overall, I think it's really good. I mean, they used to be six points and they came down to five points now. And I think they'll get a lot of play on the board with a five points. Very defensive. It depends, like I said, depends on what you're taking with you. But I really like this unit, especially at five points. That's awesome. That's, that's awesome. I, I, I can't wait to start playing these guys because I said, I love the miniatures. And I just think you know, just, I'm so glad that they're in a place now where they can be played, which is you know, it's a positive change. It's a, it's a good change by the designers. Um, one more five point unit. We've got the Kranagman Trackers. So these obviously, they're, they're more of a support unit. So they come in at five points, as, the, as I just said, and movement six. They've got Kranag Bow, which is a ranged attack, short ranged attack. It has a 7 6 4 attack profile, hitting on a 4 plus. They have a combat profile of 6 4 3, hitting on a 4 plus. They have an armor save of 6. They have a morale of 7 plus. They come with the orders, hidden traps. So when an enemy engaged, uh, well, sorry, when an unengaged enemy in long range performs any action before resolving an action, choose one. That enemy suffers one hit plus one hit for each of its remaining ranks, or that enemy suffers minus one movement until the end of the round. 
They also come with the order, mark target, which is a start of a friendly turn. Target one enemy in line of sight and long range. They become vulnerable. Um, so this is very much a supportive piece for the Stark Army. Do you play these guys much at five points? I don't play them at all. I haven't played them since a couple of updates ago where they used to have quick fire. But they are definitely a support unit. I do see them in a lot of lists. And if you can keep them out of sight, but in range of long range of enemy units, using mark targets to put vulnerable on someone can be big. Hidden traps is quite good, as the free folk use that a lot. Mm-hmm. A, a decent unit for five points for a support, but like I said, it's a, more of a support. You don't want that in the front line. You don't want that like, holding objectives, like um, keeping people engaged. You want this out of sight, doing little sly shots, just being annoying on the battlefield. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I do think there's, um, there's, there's a lot to be said for Hidden Trap. I've not really played much within the Stark Army itself. Hidden Traps is, is, is a decent order, but I've, I say, I've not really seen much uh, much use out of them in, in, in the Stark Armies of yet. But hopefully, we'll, uh, some, someone will better lead the way with them going forward, maybe with a Howland Reed list. Um, so that's it for five point units. So, as I say, there's lots of variation there for them guys at five points. Uh, we're going to step into six point units now. We're going to introduce House Mormont. Uh, first unit is House Mormont Bruisers. They have a movement of five. They hit on a three plus with a seven six five attack profile, Mason Spike. They have a five plus armor save and a six plus morale. The Mason Spike rule says before rolling attack dice, choose one. For each of this unit's destroyed ranks, choose plus one. And you have the option of critical blow, precision, reroll any attack dice. And in Season 4, they've just been updated to have Disrupt, which is enemies engaged with this unit suffer a minus one to hit. Within my personal games, I tend to use this more of a commander bunker, but is that the right thing to do? Are you using House Mormont Bruisers? And if so, how are you using them? Well, I used to have the House Mormont Bruisers in my list. I used to have them a great John number as my commander, and he used to be in this unit. And he used to have Counter-Strike. It was trying to put people up from attacking them now as they've got disrupt which is a good ability to give any melee unit a uh, minus one to hit it's good now when i use these last uh, since the update i put Rickon and osher in them so they'd have counter strike as well and stubborn tenacity yeah nice so overall i know i know it's going to a seven point unit then when you put them in and it's more of a target because Rickon is with an extra point but i think they are good good units to have in your in your list, and if you use them well, they can do quite a lot of damage, especially in certain circumstances. Choosing which one you want to use between crit blow, precision, and re rolls. That's the plus side I feel of using Great Janumbo with these guys is that because he's got reckless heroism, you sort of you're always guaranteed really to have the the re roll and attack dice because you're casual on the six unless you're going over bog. So it, it really does make them a utility piece because you can critical blow a precision with it, but it's to rely on the sixes. But yeah. Good unit, though. So you, you enjoy using the bruisers, then? I do like them, yes. So next up, we have the females of the House Mormon roster. We have the She-Bears. So it's another six-point unit. They've got a movement of five. They've got Resolute Strikes, which hits on a four plus, seven, six, five attack profile, which has obviously just been upped in the Season 4 update. Um, they've got a four plus armor save. They've got a six plus morale. They've got the Order Warcry, which is a start of a friendly turn. This unit performs one morale test. On a success, target one enemy in long range. It becomes panicked or vulnerable. And their attack profile of Resolute Strikes has critical blow. And it gains plus one to hit for each of this unit's destroyed rank. So obviously, with one destroyed rank, they hit on a three plus. And with two destroyed ranks, they hit on a two plus. Um, This used to be quite clutch in most Stark armies when Warcry was more than it is now. Um, Are you still using these? Do you see them much on the battlefield? I play against them quite a lot. I should play these a lot more because they are good to keep people engaged. But they also can be a support unit with the a panicked or a vulnerable tokens. Depends on circumstances once again as a start of a friendly turn. But they will. I still. I do think they will get quite a bit of play. So next up, we have the um, the premier defensive unit of House Stark, um, House Tully Swan Shields. They have movement of four. They've got the long sword attack profile of seven five four, hit on a four plus. They have an armor save of 3 plus and a morale of 6 plus. They have the order shield wall. When an enemy is performing a melee attack on this unit, after rolling defense dice, if this unit is being attacked from the front or flank, it blocks plus one hit for each of its remaining ranks. And they also come with stubborn tenacity, which is each time this unit passes a panic test, one enemy they're engaged with suffers one wound. So they're very much a defensive unit. 
how do you run your house tally swarm shields? Well, they are definitely 100% frontline. They are your tank unit. You want to get them up the fields as fast as possible. Obviously, <laughs> full movement is not obviously fast. But once you get them engaged, they can potentially do damage. But they can also hold up a lot of units. Six points as well, which is quite good. And you can, depending on what attachments you put on them, you can make them even stronger. But overall, I think they are a very, really good tank unit to have. Definitely on your front line. Yeah. These guys really shine at the scenarios like Hone and Ready, where you just basically just tank down on a point and just you take the hits, but on a three plus armor save, you know, the stones from the wall are just bouncing off. Well, with a shield wall, it's only melee only. Yeah. So they're good for engage. But if you get ranged shots onto you, I mean, you've got a three plus armor save, which is. Really, really good. Still, still not possibly not the most powerful house tally unit, as we'll see in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, next up, we have a Stark Bowman. Now, I've always had a soft spot for Stark Bowman. I really just, I don't know, I really enjoy playing them. I tend to have quite a lot of luck with them. Uh, other people don't tend to have as much fun, I, I don't think. But um, they're a six-point unit. They have movement of five. They have a long-ranged attack profile, which hits in a three plus, seven, seven, five. They have a short sword melee attack profile, which is a five, four, three, hit on a five plus. They have a 6 plus armor save and a 6 plus morale. And they have the arrow volley rule, which is it ignores units and terrain when determining line of sight. If the defender rolls any ones on their defense dice after this attack is completed, they become weakened. Uh, start Bowman, Steve. What do you what do you think of Start Bowman? I like them. They are really good. And uh, they've been buffed, not this patch, but the patch before. They've got 6 up morale test, which used to be 7. So that's a good morale. But the, the biggest one was if Defender rolls any ones, they become weakened. That's the old version, I think, you used to have to fail a planet test to become weakened. But now, I mean, a lot of, if you get like seven hits, the chances of someone rolling the one is quite high. And making someone weakened before they get to do an attack or a charge action is is really good. But overall, I think the brilliant. You should just sit them behind one of your units so you can't get attacked from the front. And you could just shoot anyone on the board. I like them. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree, mate. I totally agree. I'm, I'm glad you feel the same about that because I just I think that they're downplayed by quite a few people. I actually think they're a really good unit, and it always makes me laugh because that that rule that one on the defense dice um, making you weaken that's that's the rule for the Baratheon Warhammers, isn't it? So these these guys shooting Warhammers at people. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So next up on screen we have the uh, possibly I feel one of the best six point units of the game. So I'm really keen to hear what what you think on. On this, on these guys, following the season four changes, so the six point house umber berserkers with a movement of six, so really quick. Uh, they've now got a fixed three plus to hit profile on a seven, eight, nine. So they've obviously got that really cool reverse attack profile on them. They have a five plus armor save and a five plus morale. Now they've got this new ability since season four called berserkers fervor. It's an innate ability, so it can't be turned off. For each of this unit's destroyed ranks, it gains plus one to defense dice rolls and plus one to morale test rolls. So on their last rank, these guys are a three plus morale and a three plus armor save. Now, are these guys as good as I think they are, or am I being deluded? Well, I've used these since the update, and I really, really do like them. But you want to keep them in a sweet spot. So you want them either at full ranks and not being able to be get one-shotted, or be on the last rank. Now... If you're in the middle, it's kind of a danger spot because if you could, uh, it could go either way depending on what they're getting attacked by. But when I played with these, I used Bron as my attachments. So if I controlled the bags, the armor went to plus on last rank. The armor went to two up armor, and the morale went to two. <laughs> so as long as you own the bags, you will have two up on both on last rank. But you also hit the nine nine dice on three plus, which is quite good. And depending on NCUs and cards, you could get re-rolls and do some serious damage with that. I really, really, really do like this unit. And I will see a lot of play of this, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'll be honest, but I don't know how, but I've never picked up on the Bron, Bron thing. That is crazy. Having a 2 plus arms, having a 2 plus morale and 9 attack dice. Dancing on the edge of a sword for on the last rank. But you never want it. Me personally, you don't want to have it in the middle. Because four up morale, four up armor save, and someone attacking him with Sunder, and you go back to five, and you could basically get one shot. It depends on how many, how much health you have on the second rank. But I think definitely a really good unit, really strong, fast, maneuverable unit. I mean, when we did the season four update uh, video, I, I said that I can't wait for 
the next mini factions be released because I'm, I'm willing it to be House Umber because that will be one hell of a faction to see on the battlefield. Cool. Um, so next up, we've got another Season 4 Sweet unit in the Stark Outriders. So um, these guys are the first cavalry unit we're going to be looking at today. So they've got a movement of six. They have the Outriders Blade, which is a 7-4 attack profile, hitting on a 4+. plus. It's a 4 plus armor save, a 6 plus morale. They come with a new, this is, so this was the new change. They come with the order tactical reposition now. So start of an enemy turn, target one friendly unit in short range. They perform a three inch shift. They come with the cavalry innate ability rule, which is each model in this unit has three wounds. And at the start of this unit's activation, it may perform one maneuver action. Now we'll see this rule come up on a few cards going forward. Um, so I won't read this out every single time, um, but it's just a common ability for cavalry. And they come with ambush. So enemies this unit successfully charges in the flank or rear, become panicked and weakened. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Stark Outriders? I have, I have tried these, and I think they are a very good maneuverable unit with the six movements. Well, it's six minimum because you get your free cavalry move. But they're also a good support unit to get units into combat or out of combat with the three inch shift. And with, like I said, with the manoeuvre with them, they can go pretty much 18 inches across the battlefield. So overall, I think I think these will get a bit of play as well. Yeah, well what, what sort of units do you feel you're sort of shifting around with a tactical reposition? You're shifting other cavalry themselves? What are you using that for? The game mode I played with these, I played on a dance with dragons. So when my one of my units controlled the token, you can only move two inches. Now, with the shift three inches, you can actually shift the three inches. So being able to pull your unit back so it's more defensive, so they have to come towards you, is quite good. But like also, it's having the three-inch shift to maybe bring a unit, make a, a unit go forward, means that the next, your next turn, you, that unit's three inches closer, so you've got more of a chance of charging someone straight off the bat. Yeah, see, I, I like them, mate. You've convinced me. I'll definitely give these a go. I've always liked the Stark Outriders. I, I, I was really sort of sad when they moved them to, from a 3-plus to hit to a 4-plus to hit. I'd still like to see them go back to a 3-plus, but you know, we can't have everything, can we? I know. Um, next up, we have Cranagh and Bog Devil, so one of the newer Stark units. Um, so these guys have got loads of rules, so you might want to go and make yourself a nice cup of coffee, start cooking dinner while <laughs> I read this card out. So a 7-point unit. Um the first of our seven point units, I believe. They've got Moment of Six. They've got Poison Tridents, which is a, a melee attack, hitting on a three plus on a seven five four. They've got a five plus armor save and a five plus morale. They've got the order scout openings, which is a start of a friendly turn, target one enemy in long range. Until the end of the turn, friendly units attacks on that enemy may reroll any attack dice and gain precision. So that obviously accounts for both ranged and melee attacks. Uh, they come with the order swift retreat. After an enemy completes a melee attack on this unit, this unit performs one retreat action. Now, this is where it gets a bit ruly. So the poison tridents. So when they make the melee attack, before rolling the attack dice, choose one. The defender becomes weakened or attach one crown of poison card to the defender. On the right hand side of the screen, we've got the crown of poison. So I'll quickly read this out for you. Each time each unit performs an action, so obviously this is attached to the enemy unit, each time each unit performs a, an action, before resolving the action, it suffers one wound, plus one wound if it has any condition tokens on it. If this unit would ever remove a condition token, you may remove this card instead of that token. Now, loads of rules in this one, Steve, so I'll, I'll let you go to town now. These guys, they look really cool on paper, and I've had quite a good bit of luck with scout openings, but what do you think of them? I mean, overall, they're a good unit, very supportive. I mean. Scout opens, it's a brilliant ability. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to poison someone, and if you, like you said, if you can get those tokens on people, and they, they can take some serious wounds when they, uh, when they, they activate as well, isn't it? When the enemy activates, if they've got the poison on them. Yeah, any action, yeah. So things like, um, I've seen these, these really go to town on things like the Thraki veterans, where they'll activate, they'll move, so they could potentially take two wounds, shoot with quick shot, so potentially take another two wounds, and then form their action and potentially take another two wounds. So potentially, it really does hamstring things like the Fracky Veterans because you can take so many wounds from literally just moving. That is madness. I think it is a really good unit. Uh, seven points. I mean, there are quite a lot of new stuff to play around with with Starks at the moment. So seven points, you've got to be really committed to what, what you want to use them for. 
Okay, so next up we have the house under great axis. So these guys got a, I, I would say buff, but it seems to be a complete rework with the season four update. So they're a seven point unit. They hit, they've got a movement of five. They've got a six five four attack profile, which is hitting on the three plus. They've got a four plus armor save, and they've got a five plus morale. They come with Executioner's Fury, which is their attack ability. So then they come with Vicious as standard. Only defense die rolls of six may block hits from this attack. Uh, if this unit has only one remaining rank after this attack is completed, the defender becomes weakened. And they come with Ferocious Assault. Enemies successfully charged by this unit become panicked. Um, how some are great axes. They're not the, the plague they were when they first came out, but they're looking like they're in a sweet spot now. Have you managed to play any games with these guys? I have played well, I get one game with them so far, and I really love them. They're definitely going to be in at least one of your lists when I go to the tournaments, because they can proper make way. So people who've got really good defence saves, that ignores it. No matter what, you've got to roll a six to defend, which is really good. So is it champions to stack, which um, the defence is two? Yep. No, not anymore with these guys. It's a six. They'll, they'll thread through them and then vicious on top of it. And depending on what attachment you put in them, they could be unbelievably deadly. But I really, really rate them. Seven points. I know it's a bit steep, but I think definitely want to want to have in your army and will get played quite a lot. Yeah. Do, you, do, do, they, do they have much? Because I've not managed to play these guys yet. Have they got much staying power? Obviously, four plus armor, so five plus morale is, is a good defensive um, profile. But they tend to look like they might be a bit of a target. No, to, to, the game I played with them, the person I played against was scared to pl- put the unit close by these because they had a good armor save, yeah. which is pointless because it's yeah, these just melt through them, melt through the armor. So they kind of scared people off. I mean, if you've got an armor save of five or six, then you're going to go straight into these because you've got nothing to worry about. Their abilities doesn't really affect them. But people with really good armor saves, I think they'd be more scared about where they're going to position if they're going to attack them. Especially some of the cards in the stock deck that can make these attack more than once around. Yeah, I'll see that. So now we come on to the last of our seven point units, which is a brand spanking new unit. Again, it's another House Umber unit, which we love. We do love a House Umber unit here at House Stark. Um, we have the House Umber Ravagers. So these guys are a six plus movement. They've got the Executioner's Axe. And what it is, it's the same reverse type profile that the House Umber Berserkers have. So they hit on the 3 plus. They had six dice on full ranks and eight dice on their last rank. They have a 5 plus armor save and a 5 plus morale. They have the cavalry rule. And they have the Executioner's Axe, which has got Sundering. And if this unit has fewer remaining ranks than the defender, this attack gains vicious and the defender becomes panicked. Now, I've run these guys a couple of times. The miniatures are absolutely stunning. That reverse profile is really good as well. Um, yeah, have you, have you played much of the House Umber Ravagers? How are you, how are you finding them? I've not played these yet, as I haven't got my hands on the units, but I cannot wait to play with them. They are a really, really nice, strong attacking unit with Sundran, and most of the time you're going to be charging people with the infantry. It's got three ranks, so you're going to get the vicious and the panic ability. Um, to proc off that, and if you can get, like I said before, Caitlin being able to hit with the highest attack dice, if you can get that on them with the eight dice, especially as good as the Tully cards, but with two less dice, but being able to give Vicious and Panic as well, I think, yeah, I really like them. I can't wait to play them. I say I played them a couple of times and I've had a lot of fun with them, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nothing quite like um. Just rolling a unit of um of bearded Northern straight into a uh, to line of infantry and screaming for the north. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, right. So that's the last of seven point units. We're going to get ourselves into the eight point units now, starting with potentially what is one of the most deadliest units in the entire game at the moment, which is the House Tully Cavaliers at eight points. They've got a movement of five. They have the lance hitting on a three plus on a six four attack profile. They have an armor save of 3 plus and a morale of 5 plus. They have the cavalry rule, as discussed before. The lance has sundering, and when charging, rolls plus 2 attack dice for each remaining rank in this unit. And they also have rally banner. Each time a friendly unit in short range passes a morale test, that unit restores one wound. 
Now, I thought we were we potentially could have seen a change for these guys in the series uh, four or season four updates, but they kept them as is. And I'll be honest, I think they are absolutely stunning as a unit. And I think the rally banner really gave Stark something they really needed in the, in the healing stuff. But I'll, I'll I can stand there and gush about these guys all day. But I'll let you do it. You're our expert. How do you how are you playing your house, Tully Cavaliers? Oh, all the time. I love these this unit. I've always have a units of uh, Tully Cavaliers in my list. They are obviously brilliant charging people. They're good when they're engaged, but you don't want them engaged. You want them kind of charging people if you can. So you want to try to keep them out of being engaged. You want to hit hard like a truck and then get out and then do it again. That's what you want to try and do with them. Now with Rally Banner being able to heal and with the 5 up morale, which is quite good, they can heal every time they pass a planet test. Now, if you put the... I can't remember the name of it. Is it the Guardian? Winterfell Guardian, yeah. Yeah, if you put one there, minute, you can heal two off passing the morale test. And if you've got your Stark Bowman flying into combat with these, these can keep healing while they're engaged so they can stay in combat for a long time. And having the Sunderland ability, that's just uh, that's probably one of the best abilities in the game. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Sunderland is a, is a hell of a powerful ability in the game. But they could have... Like, I, they are a really good unit, but they could have nerfed them by changing the dice roll to plus one dice for each remaining rank. But we don't create the game, and they're still the same powerful units as it's always been. Yeah, 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 exactly. We don't create a game. I'm quite happy to keep running these guys and screaming for House Umber <laughs> as I roll dice across the board. Um, uh, so now we're on to our last uh, infantry unit, I believe. And this is um, Eddard's Honor Guard. So this is obviously a unit you can only take with Eddard Stark. Uh, so the unit's on the screen now. I've, I've included Eddard Stark's uh, card as well, because obviously this unit doesn't exist without Eddard, unless you obviously you get Drogo'd and he's removed from the unit. But for, for, for the purpose of this video, we presume that we'll have these rules as well. So they're basically a unit of beefed up um, Stark's Swan Sword. So they've got a 5 plus movement, or sorry, 6 points, 5 movement, uh, a 7, 6, 5 attack profile, uh, hitting on a 3 plus. They've got a 3 plus armor save and a 6 plus morale. They have Winter's Bite, which is critical blow. If this unit has one or more destroyed rank, it gains plus one to hit. If this unit has two destroyed ranks, it may reroll any attack dice. And also has go down fighting. So each time a rank in this unit is destroyed, one enemy they're engaged with suffers one wound. Uh, and obviously with the Eddard card, they come with Rally Cry and Iron Resolve. So Rally Cry is when uh, each time this unit is performing a melee attack, before rolling attack dice, target one other friendly unit in long range. It restores two wounds. And Iron Resolve is plus one to panic test rolls and minus one wound from failing panic tests. So essentially these guys are a five plus morale when it comes to panic tests. I love these guys. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about the Eddard's Honor Guard? Yeah, I think they're brilliant. I mean, if you take Eddard Stark as your commander, you have to take this unit. That hands down. Like you said, it's the Stark Sworn Swords, Onsteads, that's what it is. Yeah. And when you're down to two ranks, you're still hitting a six dice, but you're hitting a two plus. And if you've charged someone or you've got a chance to get re-rolls, you're going to fish for those crit blows, let's face it. Go Down Fighting is new ability that they given in the last update, which they, did, they didn't need to be buffed, but that's still a little buff. And being able to... After doing the attack, you can restore two wounds to a friendly unit in long range. But they've took that out of of all the of everything, haven't they? So this is pretty much the only one that does it now. Am I am I, am I right? John Snow lost it. I think um, it's it's on the Martell outriders, but I think as far as commanders go, it's only Eddard Stark now that has Rally Cry. Yeah, yeah, and that that's a good ability in itself. And Iron Resolve is good as well. And some of his cards can make make all this happen more than once around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, overall, I I love Eddard as a, as one of the commanders. I do play him quite a lot, and I do run this unit, and I usually build my army obviously around this unit. Sweet, that's a, that's a head of recommendation there. So yeah, I, I agree. Man. I think as a six point unit, they're um they're definitely definitely a decent one. I'd love to see them bring out an actual unit for them, do you know what I mean? Like an actual sculpt, an actual box set for them. Because at the minute, you just have to use Swan Swords. I tend to use the ones from the, the new Stark start set because they were cloaked up and look quite nice. I did, uh, at one point, I was trying to build um, his unit with Swan Sword Captains because I, I had quite a lot of them and they're all different types of sculpts. So I thought, 
you look better. Yeah. And to be fair, the Stark have got quite a few different alternative sculpts for the Stark Storm Soul Captain, haven't they? Uh, yeah, I think they got about three or four, possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think you've got the, the, the original one, plus the, the uh, Kickstarter exclusive one. Yeah. Um, the one from the new starter set and the one from the attachment. So, yes, at four, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've got all four of them. <laughs> no, <laughs> nice, nice. You've got to have everything if you're a Stark, a true Stark fan. That's true, man. That's true. How else are we supposed to d- defend the North? That is true. That is why. I mean, I know, it's, I know it sounds rich from me sitting down, sitting down south in Chelmsford. I mean, you're, you're the true, true Northman here, yeah, but I mean, you know, I'm just trying to piggyback on, on the back of it. <laughs> okay, so next up, mate, we've got the Direwolves. Now, this is. I feel this is this can be quite a big pull for people to play Starks because everyone wants to run the Direwolves. I'll put all three on the same screen because they're all pretty much the same uh, as far as the attack profile goes and the defense profile. It's all exactly the same. So they all have uh, a movement of six. They all have four dice hitting on three plus. They all have a four plus armor save and a two plus morale. They all have the Direwolf rule, which is um, an innate ability so that the, the unit has four wounds. At the start of this unit's activation, it may perform one manoeuvre action. Now, obviously, depending on which um, Stark child you bring, you obviously unlock their their uh, their direwolf. So, Rickon unlocks Shagdog, and Shagdog comes with Savage Mauling, which is Sundering, Vicious, and it gains plus one attack die for each wound that this unit has suffered. So, obviously, if it suffers three wounds, this bad boy is rolling seven dice, hitting a three plus with Sundering and Vicious, which is better than most infantry units. Summer comes with a Tooth and Claw, which is Sundering, and it comes with Brand's Protector. After Brand Stark's unit is attacked, this unit may perform one attack charge action on the attacker. So that's a bit of like a, a counter charge or, or a free action by Summer. And the last one we see on the bottom is Grey Wind. So Grey Wind has got Tooth and Claw, which is again Sundering, and it also comes with Disrupt, which is enemies engaged with this unit suffers minus one to hit. So, yeah, do you want to talk us through the Direwolves? Which one's your favourite? How you use them individually? Shaggy Dog's got to be the best one out of all three of them. Obviously, you've got to take Rick on, which gives an extra victory point if he, if he dies on the battlefield. But it's high risk, high reward, I think. But he just, uh, Shaggy Dog does get played quite a lot. Probably the most out of all three of them. Grey Wind does get played quite a bit as well. We've taken Rob Stark, that's it. <laughs> Mine went blank then. <laughs> yeah, so obviously you can take Rob Stark as your commander, an attachment or an NCU. So just three different type ways of getting Grey Wind into your list uh, and having to disrupt once again. But that's not just for Grey Wind itself. It's enemy, any other units that's engaged with Grey Wind that gets minus one. So you've got two units engaged and... Raywind's engaged as well. Then when they attack another unit, they still get minus one. Uh, Summer is probably the worst out of all three NCU, uh, all three Direwolves. It's rare that I see Summer get played at all, to be honest. But the odd person does take them because uh, Brandon Holdor gives that plus one wound when you take it as an attachment. And depending on where you put them, it could be... Um, very good, but having brand protector, you have to really have good position in play with summer to be able to pull that off. But it can be effective, but I've not. It's never worked for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's a shame that it's just the attack or charge action. Really. It'd be nice if it was a, a a move action as well, a bit like a sentinel. Yeah, yeah, that'd be brilliant. I think it'll get play all the time if it was a maneuver action as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe that's something we can wish list for future. So maybe that becomes Sentinel rather than Brand's Protector. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, so Direwolves obviously they're, they're they're a great selling point for the Starks. Three point as well. So obviously it being a three point activation, um, obviously we know that activations are strong in this game, and having the ability to have a three point activation is really good. And each of these dogs will cost you three points. Yeah, and the morale on them, obviously two plus. It's rare. Well, unless you get a lot of minuses, you ain't failing in a panic test. Yeah, yeah. You got to think, you know, you, you were looking at minus five, minus six to look, even look like they're they're going to reliably fail that paint test. So, yeah, <clears throat> decent, decent. I do like the Direwolves. That's what drew me to the, the start faction to start with. Yeah, they're very good. I like them myself. Okay, so that's all the units done. So, yeah, obviously, it's nice to see such a vast array of different units that Stark have. I do feel that Stark have got really nice multi-kit of tools that they can sort of bring to the battlefield. If you want to play a defensive game, you've got defensive units. Uh, you know, aggressive game, you've got lots of aggressive units. Um, 
it's really nice sort of like a varied thing. I, I think because they have access to so many houses, um, I'd like to see that that's going to that's going to continue going forward, and potentially uh, they're a breeding ground for some of these mini factions. Like we could potentially see these house uh, Tully or house Umber spit off or house Star Stark. It's a uh, it's exciting times, but um, let's check out some of the attachments now, Adam. So we're going to check out the that sort of the, the normal attachments before we go into the named characters. So on screen now we have the Swan Sword Captain, the Umber Champion, and the Loyalist Captain. The Swan Sword Captain comes with martial training, which is an order. When this unit is performing a melee attack before rolling attack dice, this attack may re-roll any dice, and the defender becomes vulnerable. The Umber Champion, Order, Insight. When this unit is performing a melee attack, before rolling attack dice, this attack gains Vicious and rolls its highest attack die value. Now, obviously, we've been speaking a little while ago about um, how good it can be for Starks to roll the highest attack die value at the lowest rank. And this guy gives you access to that. And the Loyalist Captain has got a Furious Charge, which means enemy units uh, successfully charged by this unit become vulnerable and superior numbers. This unit's melee attacks may re-roll any attack dice when attacking enemies with fewer remaining ranks. And all of these attachments are just one point each. So one by one, Steve, do you want to go through these attachments and how you use them and where you get most value from them? Yeah, um, the sword sword captain to start with. Uh, Mars of training, I think it's a really good ability. Being able to re-roll your attack dice and give them another condition token out. Um, having that in maybe Stark's Sworn Swords itself, or maybe the Loyalists or something like that, they could uh, they can do some damage because when you're hitting on four plus, having re rolls when you're engaged is quite good. Yeah, it is a very good attachment for one point. Yeah, I do use it myself. The Umber Champion, like I said, being able to hit with the highest attack dice. So if you got these in the berserker you could use that to hit with nine dice if you're on full ranks a three plus and you'll have vicious then on top of it the only problem with these triggers is it could stop you from using certain cards because these kind of have the same trigger so you have to decide when's best to use them yeah yeah i do find that with a lot of stark stuff is that rolling attack dice trigger is really is it, when we go for the tactics deck we'll see it as well but there's a lot of conflicting triggers going on yeah i'm oh, sorry go on sorry to interrupt you mate go on carry on no that's fine and the last one is the loyalist captain now once again if you charge someone you get the gift get out another vulnerable token which could be powerful and superior numbers so with these you do want to attack someone with lower ranks so maybe going into a cavalry unit or a wolf or something a die wolf or if that could be very effective or even if attacking someone that's infantry that's already lost one rank and you've got four ranks, it could be uh, powerful. And being able to have the rerolls, always good to have rerolls, especially if you charge someone over, over like a bog or something where you don't get your rerolls or a corpse pile. Yeah, you can't get your rerolls then. So being able to get rerolls at any time is really good. Yeah, yeah, and no, I agree, mate. I agree. Um, you know, as you can see on the screen now, mate, there's there's starts a lot of way of pumping out vulnerable tokens, which is a uh, which is nice because I, I really value from vulnerable tokens. I think they're one of the most powerful tokens in the game in this edition. Definitely. Next up, we have a Kranigman, a House Reed uh, attachments. Again, both one point. So obviously, Stark's got a lot of uh, one point attachments available to him. The Kranigman Warden comes with Overwatch. This is an order. After an enemy ends a march or maneuver action in long range and line of sight of this unit, this unit performs one ranged attack action on the enemy. And the Kranigman Survivalist has Elusive Escape. This unit may reroll any retreat dice. Um, retreat distance die, sorry. Enemies this unit disengage from may not pivot and become weakened. And it comes with Pathfinder. This unit ignores the dangerous hindering and rough keywords. Um, do you play much of these guys? I mean, like the Chrome Morden seems like it's got a, a sensible home in the start of Bowman. Oh, 100%. I mean, the only app for their own units themselves, they've only got the Fragment Trackers, which is short range. So this would be pointless in that, that unit. Uh, but in the Stark Bowman itself, it's really good. And once again, if it's a cavalry unit, you get the free manoeuvre, they're going to come into your range. You get to shift back or whatnot, or six shift sideways, uh, two inches to get a shot off. And then if you roll one on the defensive save, that unit's going to have weakened. So that's a really good ability, Kragman Warden. And plus, it's a free attack as well. And it just gives you control of the battlefield. So that can be quite annoying for certain uh, opponents and the, the Kragman's survivalist now I've never used this myself but I think it would be in a Stark unit it'd probably be best in the Kragman trackers because when they get all a unit that can get elusive escape yeah so uh, if you can 
Yeah, you need to retreat. Possibly the truckers, like I said, if you can retreat with them and then be able to get into the side of the unit that you've retreated from, they can't pivot and they become weakened. And ignoring a hindering rough, rough terrain, that could be good as well. So it can help you manipulate the board and help you be more supportive for the rest of your army. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, because when, when uh, the Cranogman Bog Devils, when they came out, I, I presume this, this would be in with them because obviously they've got a swift retreat. Do you think they they've got a home in them? Obviously, they, they, it doesn't come in the in the Bog Devil box. It comes in the Stark Attachment box. But do you feel that they might have a home in the in the uh, Bog Devils? Because obviously they've got Swift Retreat. Yeah, I mean it's definitely with having Swift Retreat getting hit and then you get be able to get into uh, the flank or even just getting away and making someone we can do once again put the condition token down could be really good. But then it, you'd have to have your Kragman Bog Devils engaged. I mean, you probably want them getting engaged anyway with the all the abilities that they've got with the poison and stuff. So that'd be a good one uh, to have in them. Yeah. If, if you play them at all, you have to let us know how, how it goes a bit. Next up, we have the well, Winterfell Guardian and the Mormont Veteran. So again, both one point attachments. The Winterfell Guardian comes is so the Winterfell Guardian is a cavalry attachment, so it will only be able to go in um, Outriders, uh, Tally Cav and Ravagers in the Stark roster. Obviously, you've got Hedge Knights and um, Flayed Men outside of Starks, but it comes with Dauntless. So each time a unit passes a morale test, it restores one wound, and it comes with Stubborn Tenacity. Each time a unit passes a panic test, one enemy they are engaged with suffers one wound. And the Mormont Veteran, with Hardened, each time an enemy is performing an attack on this unit, after rolling defense dice, this unit blocks one hit for each of its destroyed ranks. Now, both of these are... Uh, attachments that we have seen quite a lot the moment veteran less nowadays but yeah what do you think of these guys obviously the Winterfell Guardian's got a home in uh, a solid home in one of our units but do you want to sort of talk us through it yeah well the Winterfell Guardian's definitely one good attachment to go into your Tully Cav like I said before you can heal two with the the, the Tully Cav ability and with Morale 5 anyway unless you get it to make that even worse which certain cards and certain factions can or even Vicious can make that worse even so, you can get being able to heal two is really good in itself. But every time you pass a panic test, you also dish out a wound. So being able to deal wounds is really good itself. The more on veteran hardened. Now, she did lose the ability to block one normally, but I think that was quite powerful. Now, still being able to block, even on your last rank, being able to block two hits is quite good. Maybe it will get seen again in the um, the Berserkers, so they yeah, can yeah. be a lot stronger and stay around a lot longer. Yeah. But I, I still will, will still definitely see play of these still, I think, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as you, as you say, it, it seems to be quite obviously a place for her in the Berserkers that are really sort of, as you, as you described it before, it's like teetering on that knife edge of, of about to go, but, but you're most powerful. Um, and she obviously helps to sustain that. Yeah. So then we get on to the name characters. So this is where we start hitting the two points for attachments. So left to right, we've got um, the Rob Stark Small Council here. Yeah? So we've got Great John Umber, Fierce Bannerman. Uh, he comes with the innate ability to the last. So you place two wound tokens on this card at the start of the game. Each time this unit will be destroyed. Remove one wound token from this card. It makes one morale test. On a success, this unit is not destroyed but remains in play with one wound. And he comes with furious charge. Enemies successfully charged by this unit become vulnerable. Then we have Rickard Carstark, Vengeful Bannerman. Order Stark Fury. When this unit is performing the melee attack before on attack dice, this attack gains critical blow and sundering. After completing this attack, this unit suffers two wounds, minus one wound for each of its destroyed ranks, and he comes with uncontrolled rage. Each time this unit activates, if it can charge an enemy, it performs one morale test. On a failure, it performs one charge action on the nearest valid enemy and counts as rolling a six for all charge distance dice. And we have Mage Mormont, the she bear. She has go down fighting, so each time the rank in this unit is destroyed, one enemy they engage with suffers one wound, and she has unyielding. This unit suffers minus one wound from failing panic tests for each of its destroyed ranks. So we've got some decent abilities here, Steve. We've got to the last, and Great Janama is really good. Obviously keeps that them berserkers alive for even longer. And also, it's nice to see they kept Stark Fury as an order on Rickard Carstark. This is obviously the original attack ability from the Stark Swan Swords, but they removed it, I believe, in uh, Season 3, I think, I believe. Um, but yeah, what do you think these these three attachments, Dave? Are you, you playing much? 
Um, the great John Umber played a few times. Um, I think it's really good to put on one, to, on one of your powerful units because you want to keep that on the battlefield as long as possible and being able to, well, basically survive two deaths is really good. And once again, if you charge, getting out another token, powerful. Going on to Rickard Karkstar. I've never used this ability. I've always wanted to use this ability, but I like I like the commander version of him quite a lot, so I don't tend to use this ability. But being able to get crit blow and sunder, and now if you can, most of the time you'd be rolling seven dice. Now if you roll seven, I know it's a very, very, very rare, but if you can roll six to seven fixes with sundering, that could one shot a unit, and it's worth taking two wounds for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. um, and with the uncontrolled rage, now sometimes you want to fail that panic test, so then you can charge someone because to get your rerolls then because uh, you roll the six and the charge distance dice, and with the movements you could potentially roll move up to twelve inches for the charge, long bomb charge. A uh, mage more mount I've never used, and I think it's not to be negative, but I don't think that would be played as much for two points for attachments, for go down fighting and unyielding. I don't think the abilities, I think that if it went down to one point, you might get play, possibly, but at two points, I can't see many people taking that, and in fact, I've never seen anyone take it, being honest. Um, and I hate to be negative about... Not my favourite faction, but I, I mean, for the two point attachments, you need it to be like really, really good and have good abilities, in my opinion. Yeah, no, 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 totally. But yeah, and the thing is, it's fine to be negative about that because we're going to get onto a commander version, which is, I think, a lot better than the um, the attachment version. I, I do agree. I think for two points, that doesn't really pull its weight. Um, but if you know, if you're running an army where you want a runner, give her a crack and uh, prove us wrong. We throw down the gauntlet, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> So next up, we have Brendan Tully, uh, Vanguard Infiltrator. Brendan Tully, Unyielding Knight, and Sirio Pharrell, First Blade of Bravos. So the Vanguard Infiltrator is the normal attachment. It's a, sorry, it's a cavalry attachment. Uh, it comes with marked targets, so start with friendly turn, target one enemy in line of sight, and long range, they become vulnerable. He comes out flank, which is you may hold this unit off of the table in reserve instead of deploying it. At the start of any round, if you are not the first player, you may place one unit from reserve fully within short range of a friendly or flank table edge, unactivated. Next, we have Brendan Tully, Unyielding Knight. So he comes with the innate ability, Affiliation House Tully. This unit is a House Tully unit, um, which suggests that we're going to get some more House Tully stuff in the future. He comes with Dauntless. Each time this unit passes a morale test, it restores one wound. And he has Iron Resolve. This unit gains plus one to panic test, test rolls and suffers minus one wound for failing panic tests. And finally, for two points, we have Sirio Pharrell, first player of Bravos. He comes with Precision. This unit's melee attacks gain Precision and he comes with Agile. I believe this is the only Agile rule we have in the entire game. It's basically Disrupt, but it's for all attacks, so including ranged attacks as well. So enemies suffer minus one to hit when attacking this unit. Also, we need to say as well that you can only field Sirio Pharrell in an army that includes either Eddard Stark or Arya Stark, the Wolf Girl. And it's important that we do say the Wolf Girl because the new neutral version, I presume, means you couldn't take this because I believe by the time she's travelling with uh, the Hound, Sirio Pharrell's already been chinned by Meryn Trent. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm quickly chucking my opinion because I've, I've, I've run my attachments recently. So I've ran... Brendan Tully, Vanguard Infiltrator in Umber Ravagers, and I found that worked really well because it let me throw out a vulnerable target before throwing the Sundering, Vicious, Panics, the Distributing, Mad Men uh, out, and it was nice to put them in the flank. But it did make it a nine-point unit. That's my my take. I think that was quite a good combo. I think it's probably a one-trick pony. I think so after it happens once, no one's going to let you do it again. But yeah, so do you want to go over these three attachments? What do you think? I do like the Brendan Tully, Vanguard attachments. Two points. It is quite steep. But outflank, if you can use it well, and the new version of outflank is a lot better where you come on if you're second in a round, whereas you had to take horses because it kind of stopped you from using the outflank. It was quite hard because people tend to take the horses to stop you from bringing units on, but being able to bring it on when you're second in a round is a lot stronger, and I'm glad they've uh, updated that. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Really good change. Yeah. The Brendan Tully uh, attachments, I have not 
used it because I like his commander card a lot better. And I think it's, it's like I said before, two points. The abilities aren't the best for two points. Yeah. Um, if you drop down to one point, you'd probably get to see play, but at two points, I I don't run that myself, and I've never seen anyone run that again. But going to Serial Burrell, now two points for Agile and Precision, I think it's really, really good. Obviously, it forces you to take either Eddard or Arya into your list, which is one downside, but because you might not have them part of your list, you're part of your play. But if you can get them in your list and be able to get into a unit, maybe the new, um, the new updated version of Bruisers, if you can get them into that unit. A melee attack will be minus two to hit, but any range will just give you minus one to hit. But being able, once again, you don't really want to, when you've got keywords like precision, you don't really want to put, you don't want to put that into a unit that has that keyword anyway, because it's kind of a waste of ability. And then that's when the points are kind of wasted. You want to put that into a, a unit that doesn't have precision. And like you said, Agile's being the only one in the game it is really good. It's a really good ability. Yeah. Well, it's a good combination, mate. Real combination. Next up, we have uh, Jacques and Hagar, which is Mysterious Prisoner. So these are... It, Jacques and Hagar is one point. It can only be included in an army that includes Arya Stark. Before deployment, attach Jack into an enemy infantry unit, ignoring the usual attachment limits, which just means that basically he, he can go in units with attachments already in them. Uh when Jacken is destroyed, uh, so he comes with the innate ability, a man freed, a name owed. When Jacken is destroyed, your opponent may target one of your combat units. It suffers three wounds. As one of these wounds, they may destroy one infantry attachment in that unit. We also have on screen, uh, for one point, Mira Reed, Cunning Trapper. So she comes with all the hidden traps. When an unengaged enemy in long range performs any action before resolving an action, choose one. That enemy suffers one hit plus one hit for each of its remaining ranks. Or that enemy suffers minus one movement until the end of the turn. And she comes with the affiliation Kranigman. Now, this is important when we talk about um, Harlem Reed. Uh, and we'll talk about Harlem Reed's uh, tactic cards in, an, in another video. Um, we do the deep dive. Um, but it's quite important for that. So, yeah, just we'll, we'll come back to it later on. And we also have Jojen Reed for two points. He's got affiliation, Kranigman again. And he also comes with the innate ability, Jojen, Jojen's Green Sight. So each time this unit performs an attack or charge action, before resolving the action, it gains one of the following. It can re-roll any attack dice, it may re-roll any charge distance dice, and ignores a hindering and rough keywords this turn. Now, when the last major update came out, they tweaked Jojen. He didn't look like this, he was slightly different to this. And they sort of kept him at two points, but kept him, in my opinion, in exactly the same place that he was, which is, it looks really good, but I don't really see it played that much. But, I mean, do you, do you, I'll let you take the reins now, man. So, yeah, do you want to go through these attachments one by one and how you're playing them? I have used Joe and Reed before in the Stark Bowman, because I think it's yeah. good to be able to get the re-rolls. It's not good. I used it for the re-rolls mainly. Obviously, I'm not going to use it for the charge because you're not going to charge Bowman into anyone unless you're crazy. And I've done that once before. <laughs> <laughs> it was a close game, but it was I nearly kind of drew the game, I think it was, by doing a charge with the Bowman. But it just didn't do enough wounds because I think it only had five dice on like four or five plus. It was just terrible. I don't know. Two points is quite steep just to get re-rolls, to be honest. So I've used it. Like, as a friendly game, I'd use it. But if it went to a tournament, I wouldn't take it. It's not. With the two points. Miller Reed, for one point, uh, being able to get traps on someone, and like you said, with the affiliation, Krugman, that using the Howland's cards can make that ability, it, it triggers his cards and his abilities and stuff like that, which is really good. But I think hidden traps are a good ability in itself. Being able to give hits to someone, especially when they're just moving away from you, or if you think that someone's going to charge it or make a charge on another unit of yours, then you can use the minus one movement at the end of the turn and it'll just slow them down or make them further uh, charge distance dice. So it's very really good for support. And yeah. Jack and Naha, now I have never used this, but I've always been interested and curious about it. I think it could be, I mean, because I've never used it, is it when you kill the unit that he's in, you can trigger that? It's when, when Jack and he's destroyed. So, um, yes, it, when his unit is destroyed, but also I've seen filthy combinations where someone will put him in a unit 
and then basically charge Vargo Hote at him. Oh, that's then, nasty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kill him, and then just wipe out a really powerful attachment in the, in the army. That's a nice combo. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Never thought about that. Never thought about that. You know, yeah. Yeah, could be interesting. Yeah. That could be my next list. Do it. <laughs> do so it what? Yeah. I think I'm going to make a list and do that. I'm going to try that myself. I'll probably get called all the words under the sun. <laughs> no, my look, it'll probably be against somebody who runs Targaryens with just all um, cavalry, <laughs> and they'll be just pointless then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, go on. So okay, yeah. So yeah, that's that's what. Yeah, it's when he's when he's destroyed. So if you've got a way of killing him outside of um, destroying unit, he he's a really good attachment to uh, to throw out there. Yeah. I mean, if you can. Utilize that, then that can be really powerful. But once again, it's it's a lot of stuff to go through together. But for one point, probably worth a try. So yeah. Um next up we have the a couple of the Stark children. So we have Rob Stark, the young wolf, he comes in at two points. He has the order swift retreat, which is after enemy completes a melee attack on this unit. This unit performs one retreat action. And he has enhanced mobility, which is this unit gains plus one movement and may pivot before marching. Um, and we have Bran and Hodor with the, the, potentially the most confusing set of rules ever printed on a card. So they've got the, ro- the rule Hodor, which is this unit's melee attack still plus one wound. And also Hodor, when this unit is performing a retreat action, after rolling retreat distance dice, you may have all the dice counters rolling a six. If you do, this attachment loses all abilities until the end of the game. So... The second ability is supposed to sort of represent Hodor holding the door and Bran sort of getting dragged away. I think the way I think the, the way on that, I think it's like it's either Hodor or Hodor. <laughs> I think that's how you've got to wear it if you're going to use it. But I've never used the second ability on Bran and Hodor, but I've actually used that attachment. Yeah, well, maybe it should be Hodor and Hodor question mark second ability. <laughs> Hodor, maybe. <laughs> I mean, some people I have seen people run this attachment without the ball. With the Dr. Direwolf, because as an attachment, it's actually all right. Getting get that plus one wound to trigger a panic test can be powerful. But I've never <laughs> I've never used the second part because, yeah. depending on what is the circumstances, and I tend to just go in and I never come out. So, <laughs> so that's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> so how stark are you, mate? We, they refuse to uh, refuse to, to bow down. <laughs> never flee. Yeah. So, did you play the the Robert Stark attachment much? I've used it, and I've used it in the Berserkers once before because well, I'm, cause they go to a seven up movement then. Yeah, yeah. And then a marching at fourteen inches is stupid, <laughs> but, <laughs> but so much fun. Yeah, I'm be, like being able to pivot before march. That's that's a, that's a that's a decent ability as well. And if you do take that attachment once again, you can see. Greywind as well. There's just three, three points. Yeah, he's um. So I quite like him. Or I say I like the idea of him in Pranagman trackers, just because you're able to push the traps where you need them to be. You can probably run them into the trackers now because the trackers used to have swift retreat as an order on the on the card themselves, the unit card. But now they've lost that ability to get to, uh, mark target. So this could be quite good to be back in them. Yeah. Might give it a, a little shake, see what happens then. So, yeah, so two all right attachments there. I think, you know, it's, it's good that they're in the game and it's nice to have access to the, to the Dire Wolves. Next up, we have potentially the most um, popular of the Stark children. We have Rickon Stark. So he comes as a one-point attachment. He has valuable captive. So it's an innate ability. So this unit gains plus one to morale test rolls. But when Rickon is destroyed, your opponent gains one victory point. So that's an additional victory point on top of the... Um, victory through combat rule um but he also gains by taking rickon you can take osha as a zero point attachment it can only be filled in an army that includes rickon stark and must be attached to his unit ignoring the usual attachment limits and she comes with counter strike so each time this unit is attacked with a melee attack for each miss the attacker suffers one hit and stubborn tenacity each time this unit passes a panic test one enemy they're engaged with suffers one wound um Rick on Stark, Steve. Do you um, do you, do you use him much? Uh, quite a lot. It's, I think it's the most. To bring the diable shaggy dog, this is the high risk, high reward. Having plus one morale on the unit itself is quite good. But if you, obviously you've got to bring Osher with it, and being able to get counter strike and stubborn to nasty for three basically is definitely an ability. You know, definitely someone you need to take. And last time I run this, like I said, I've, I I put them into how much more on bruises. Should you have disrupt? Counter-Strike, 
stuck into nasty tea, which is quite good. And it brings the more my blues down to five up morale. Yeah. Or another good one to put them in, uh, in my, this is my opinion, by the way, uh, is the Corkstar experiment. And now with with five points, I know it goes to six points, but the morale goes to five points, but they've also got to stand your ground. So, they won't, so if someone charges you and you only engage one person, then they don't get re-rolls on the attack unless they've got a card or abilities that they can use. But then if they don't get re-rolls, they're going to do quite a lot of misses when they attack you, potentially. And then that's where your Counter-Strike comes into play then. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good combo, mate. It's a really good combo. Yeah, I like it. I'll definitely give that a crack. As I say, so I'm quite keen to run Cast Dark Spearman after the update, so I'm definitely up for doing that. And I usually take Rick on the strength of... Um, getting access to Shaggy Dog because Shaggy Dog is just so good. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So that's the end of our attachments, mate. So that's obviously, again, I love the fact that Starks was such a varied um, option of attachments. There's a lot that sort of pivots around passing morale tests and stuff, which is um, which is quite cool. I think it's quite flavourful of, of the of the House Stark um, way of war. Uh, where the, the the brave brave win, uh, the good guys see out the day because House Stark is definitely the good guys, not the House Lannisters. Oh, definitely, I agree with you one hundred percent. Commanders, now, so what we're going to do is, as I said before, we're going to we're going to do a deep dive on the tactics deck, which includes the commander cards. So we're not going to get too much into the commander cards when we go through these cards. We're going to just they're on screen, so you can see um, what they have. So first up on screen. We have Eddard Stark, Lord of Winterfell. So he has Rally Cry. Each time his unit is performing a melee attack, before rolling an attack dice, target one other friendly unit in long range. It restores two wounds, and he comes with Iron Resolve. This unit gains plus one to panic test rolls and suffers minus one wound from failing panic tests. And his cards are Northern Defiance, Fury for the Fallen, and Lead by Example. So can you talk us a little bit, Eddard, head of House Stark and possibly the greatest character ever made in TV and books? Yeah, I mean, he's one of my favourite uh, commanders to run in this game. Definitely top two out of the commanders for Stark. He's a very aggressive uh, character, in the game, I'd say. And if he's an Eddard on the guards, he's dead or dark one swords. And he goes to attack quite a lot with the... Because a lot of people do, do melee attacks, so that's when Fury of the Fallen comes into play. If you've got the card in hand, and being able to do a free attack or free charge action is powerful. But not only that, when you do that attack, every time you use that, or Eddard's unit attacks normally, you proc the Rally Cry, which heals another unit in long range to health, which is quite, like I said, it's uh, very powerful itself, and Iron Resolve. But it's, you've got to have a very, I'd say, a very aggressive list to use all this stuff in because you want Eddard up front in your face saying come at me <laughs> uh next up we have Eddard's eldest son Rob Stark the Wolf Lord so he comes with the order tactical reposition so at the start of an enemy turn target one friendly unit in short range they perform a three inch shift um he comes with enhanced mobility so this unit gains plus one movement and may pivot before marching and he comes with regroup after completing a retreat action this unit restores two wounds Plus one wound for each of his destroyed ranks. And he comes with the uh, tactics deck or tactics cards, hit and run, superior positioning and sudden retreat. Now, since the changes to hit and run, I think that has really, really brought Rob into his own. I, I really enjoy playing Rob. He's, he's, my, he's my favourite character from um, from Game of Thrones because, you know, he's a, I, just, I just love the character. I love it, sort of the his, his storyline in the book. Um, but, yeah, I really like, really like him. Yeah. But, but, when we spoke about Tally Cav, you, you mentioned about being able to hit and then come out and then hit again. So obviously that sort of play style, Rob might play well into that. Um yeah, Rob Stark, what do you think about the 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 Wolf King? Yeah, I um, I think he's a I like his commander. He's got some really good abilities. Once again, being able to shift a unit three just that can get someone engaged next to it or can get someone further back so you don't get charged or attacked or whatnot. Just for mobility, it's really good. Being able to move that extra inch does <laughs> make a difference. Very <laughs> happen there. And, um, and if you group after attack, then you once you retreat, you restore wounds. And being able to restore wounds for free, basically, is quite good. Now, when I've used Rob, mainly I put him into the Stone Cold Davises because of their ability. They got six strike. So after this unit has completed the melee attack, it performs one retreat action. So you don't need to use any cards. It's just a hit and run. 
and that's 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 uh, probably the best one of the best units you could probably put them in. And like you said, with the hit and run, one unit uh, performs a retreat action. Uh, that used to be you had to start engaged. Now it's after a friendly unit completes melee attack, which is really good for Sully Cav. That, that's the way it used to be, didn't it? It used to be that then they changed it to this weird card um, that that you had to be engaged but you obviously don't need to be engaged anymore which i think is such a better version of the card because the card was built to work with lance cavalry that's sort of rob's rob's thing as a commander in it is that hit and run and and moving around and out maneuvering people yeah it's quite a he needs a good mobility army yeah i reckon with him with the things he wants to do with his uh, tactics so i'd say yeah i, I don't know um i wouldn't want to use this i don't know it depends what you want to do on your what you use them against, what factions you want to play them against. I mean, it'd probably really good against Brathians because Brathians are slow and tanky, so you can get in, out, move around, make them think where they want to go and stuff. So maybe a slow moving faction probably be the best to use this commander on. Yeah, definitely. Is it worth running? And I say it's one of my favourite commanders, um, just because of the character more than anything else. And obviously, you obviously you're getting this guy for free as your commander, which then unlocks, as you said before. Grey Wind for three points. Yeah, for three points. You can't go wrong. It's an extra activation for three points. And you can, depend on the scenario that you're playing, it could uh, work really well, especially with the Diables mobility. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's Rob Stark. Next up is probably one of the, the most frequently used commanders now for uh, Stark. And I believe it's probably because of uh, the Berserker Tactics card, because that is one of the most ludicrously powerful cards in, in the face of the world. But we'll go. We're not going over Tactics cards today, Steve. But we'll go over it and we'll sort of hint at what might be powerful. So this is Great Janumba, Lord of Last Half. So he gets the Order Overrun, which obviously just seen a buff in the Season Four update. So now when this unit surges fourth, um, instead of surging fourth, this unit performs one charge or a march action. Now I've been quite vocal with my praise for that change. I, I believe that. Having the ability to use an order, even when, whenever you want, because having the charge was great. Uh, obviously, surging fourth is great, but being able to say I'm going to use my overrun order, even when you can't charge, is is good. And I think that that's, that's a good good change because it's nice to have your your toys do stuff that you want them to do. Um, it also comes with the order reckless heroism. So when this unit performs a Charge action, before resolving the action, this unit suffers D3 wounds, but counts as rolling a 6 on all charge distance dice, so you can reliably charge the full distance that you're able to charge with the unit. And it comes with the affiliation House Umber, so this unit is a House Umber unit. And he has the uh, cards Last Stand, Lash Out, and Berserker Tactics. Great John Umber, I've been using him quite a lot recently. Is he as powerful as I believe he is? I, I think he is. He, I've used him a lot of times and like you said the positive t- change on overrun is brilliant because like you said you sometimes you can can't charge someone off after killing someone so being able to march or even even if you march and you get behind so you position yourself behind it's just tactically position is just brilliant and also you don't have to be that close to them to get a charge off Taking D3 wounds to get an auto 6 is really big and also manipulates the battlefield because people can have that in mind. Well, if I position here, I'm 11 inches away, but I can get charged. So I'll just be further out. So kind of like makes people second guess what they're going to do. We could talk a little bit about it, but I think the fact that Swift reposition exists in the, in the House Stark de- deck, it has people really, really... Um worried about moving too close to great john because potentially with the with the three inch maneuver that you get from um swift re- reposition if you have the horse or even just the the is it a three inch shift or two inch shift it's a two inch shift if you don't own the horses but if you own the horses it's a three inch maneuver so if you're in a unit of, of uh, berserkers you know potentially you're looking at um you know, a 14 inch charge there so people he really does yes. dictate where people will move to and I think that's that is a great control aspect of Great John Umber. And with this with this what his cards do as well, what you can do, it's just it's disgusting. It can be disgusting. We I recently ran a tournament down in Chelmsford and uh I, I, I put out a survey form afterwards and one of the pits of feedback was please don't allow Berserker Tactics to be played at this tournament ever again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean it is powerful. I reckon you could probably nerf that a little bit by saying take D three wounds. You don't need the, the additional one. 
depending on who you're charging or how you're attacked. And it's after the attack phase as well. So if you know you're going to one-shot the unit with by using knives. See, it is dirty tactics, and that's the way I like to play. <laughs> he's, the, uh, he's the king of aggression, isn't he? The, the, the man who thinks he's aggressive, but he obviously has, hasn't been in a bar late night drinking with Great Janumba because he's going to get a toe punt. Next up, we have <laughs> Brendan Tully, the Blackfish. This is the infantry commander. Um, he comes with the affiliation House Tully. So this unit is a House Tully unit. Um, which does matter for his cards, or for one of his cards at least. Um, he comes with Stalwart, which is this unit gains plus two to morale test rolls, and he comes with Stand Your Ground. So each time an enemy performs a melee attack on this unit, if this unit is only engaged with one enemy, that enemy does not gain charge, flank, or rear bonuses. Now, Brendan Tully, the Blackfish, really is sort of the start premier defensive commander, as far as I can see. Um, I haven't used him very much, but you mentioned earlier that he's one of your favourite commanders, so I'm very, really interested to hear how you're how you're using him. Well, I think he's my third best commander um, for the Starks, and I do really like him. He doesn't, I don't, he doesn't get played much, but I think um, if you can get step for charge in your hand, that's a good ability to have, uh, or a good card to have. Now, when I've run Ben Tully, I tend to run him into the Stone Cold Davises. So if someone charges you, you play separate charge, you hit them, and then you run away. They don't get to attack. Their, their charge is wasted. And then you've and then you've moved around the around the board, they've done their activation, they charge you, you've hit them, they haven't hit you, you've run away, and next minute it's your goal. So, yeah, it's a wasted turn for them. But two morale, always brilliant. Always brilliant. And stand your ground. But after uh, reading this card, because I haven't... I like played him for a while. Stand your ground could be a, a good unit to put him in, which I might try, would be in the Moron Bruises. I do like a, I think he come back to me. I do like these. But like having stand your ground and disrupt, you're not gonna get much hits on you, I don't think. Unless they have be it's nice to got the be able to get a re rolls and things like that. But I thought it could be a nice little combo that I might try out myself. Don't oh, give it a go, mate. Let us know how it goes. As I say, I'm really interested in using again. Brennan Sally's a great a great character from the book, so it's nice to see him with a very, very um, uh, what's called individual playstyle for starts because we don't have very many super like because all of his cards tend to be quite um, a defensive or separate charge, very defensive. Refuse to yield is quite defensive. Um, Warcry not so much, but it's but even his card itself is quite nice. So it's quite nice having that quite clear identity from from House Tully. And I'm really excited about the potential that we're going to see a House Tully mini uh, faction. Yeah, I can see like um, a few factions coming out, little mini ones, like the Boltons came out. And uh, I think it would be good for the game as well. Yeah, 100%, mate. Yeah, more factions and more four. Um, so, yeah, thumbs up for uh, Brendan Tully. Next up, we have Roderick Cassell, uh, Master at Arms. Now, in the last edition of the game, he's one of my favourite commanders. I used to love putting him in Bowman and running him in there. Um, so he comes with all the marked targets so I'll start for any turn target one enemy in line of sight and long range they become vulnerable um, he also has boldness and courage which is the first time first and only time I believe we see this in Starks so it's uh, it affects ranged and melee at each time his unit attacks if he has full ranks it gains plus one attack dice otherwise it is treated as having plus one rank for attack dice and he comes with combat prowess press advantage and martial superiority um, Roger Cassell, you having much luck playing Roderick? Uh, I've played him a couple of times. Um, he is fun to play with, and his cards um, have got better because you used to have to have certain condition tokens on and have to spend them. Now you just have to have the condition token on them, and you can, as long as you've got that condition token, you don't spend it. So that's made it more, um, made it more powerful, I think. Uh, when I did, when you usually run them, I mean, Stark Bowman is probably the obvious one that everyone does run them in because it's uh, having eight dice and being able to make someone vulnerable in long range before you, before your attack is quite good. But one unit I put them in, which I enjoy and it's quite fun, I put them in the uh, the Bastard Girls. Yeah. Now, when I put them in the Bastard Girls, it's the Boldness and Courage is for melee and ranged. So you, if you've got four ranks, you're going to hit on five dice. So you make them vulnerable, shoot them, you spend the vulnerable token, so you do some damage, you do a panic test. After that, after you've done that hit, they become vulnerable off the shot. Now, if you're in range, you get to charge them. Now, if you charge them, 
you'd be seven dice if you're four ranks, like I said, seven dice hitting on threes, and then you're obviously the vulnerable again, and then you're taking another planet test. Yeah. So you can potentially one shot a unit. Well, that's kind of two shots really, but yeah, stay somewhere. They have to give that give that run out. Sounds like has a it's a stay some. I like the, I like finding little combos and things like that just to the, you know to make this make it more fun. Like when someone says like, "Oh, that won't work," or "That's no good." I sense ah, I'll make that work. I'll try that. Um, cool. That's Roderick. Uh, next up, we have uh, Howland Reed, uh, Lord of the Cranog. So he has the order superior flanking. When an enemy unit in long range performs an attack or four rolling attack dice, if attacking the defender in the flank or rear, the defender becomes panicked and vulnerable. He has the affiliation Cranogman. So this unit is a Cranogman unit, which is an innate ability, cannot be taken off. And he comes with Disrupt. It was, again, we see Disrupt. Uh, enemies engage with this unit, suffer minus one to hit. We see a lot of Disrupt and Agile and minus to hit in Starks, which is quite... Quite nice for for their to keep my life a little bit longer. Maybe it helps keep my life in the last rank. And he comes with three uh, individual uh, Howland Reed only cards. So he comes with the, the Threat Unseen, Crown of Traps, and Bog Devil Ambush. Now we're going to go over the cards in more detail when we do the deep dive. Um, but obviously they work really well when using his children as well. Um, Howland Reed, Lord of the Cranogs. Are you um? Do you play much? Uh, I played them once, and it was kind of. You need to have really good positioning and things like that with him. And I've played against him, and he is a pain to play against, especially when you um, when you know how to use him properly. But he has got loads of nice little shenanigans that he can do on the battlefield. But you've got, like you said before, when you were talking about the attachments and units having the affiliation, saying Kragerman. Now that's when the cards trigger certain things, like you were saying before, and. Uh, you have to bring some of the attachments to trigger some of the cards to make it more effective. Yeah, yeah. In my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree, and and that is potentially why I would like to see Jojen um, tweaked slightly and brought down to one point, just so you can get more out of um, Alan Reed's cards. But he's again, he's he's, he's a great character, um, and he's. But I, I do feel playing him is a challenge, and he is. Well, with, you've got to be. You've got to be. Yeah, it is a challenge. It's very technical, and I think it's too technical for me. I'm like, it's, it's too much thinking. Uh, let's just go in there, destroy, and get out, have a brew. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so quite a niche commander, but, you know, nice to, nice to if you have got time to sit and practice with him, he's, he's a, a, he, he will pay your dividends. Next up, we have our second version of Brendan Tully as a commander. This time, we've got the Outrider commander. So he comes with the order Sentinel. Oh, sorry, so he is a cavalry attachment, so cavalry commander. There's an older sentinel. After another friendly unit in long range is attacked, this unit performs one charge or maneuver action. If charging, it must char- target the attacker. He comes with elusive escape. This unit may re-roll any retreat distance dice. Enemies this unit disengages from may not pivot and become weakened. So you have uh, the three cards here, which is, tends to be the three cards we see in various combinations across the game on Manic Commanders. So we've got ride them down, ride by attack, and Marshall. Um, I've only ever used him once as a commander, again, just to get the badge on uh, some of us of our stats, but Brendan Tully, Outrider Commander, have you used him more? Um, I've, used, I've used him a few times. He's quite good, because I think, personally, one of my best abilities in the game, I'm good with cavalry. Uh, but it's not much not much out there for cavalry, you know, for Stark themselves, they've only got like the Tully Cav and the Outriders, but now they've got the Umber Ravagers. So maybe some combos with that. I know you've got the neutral ones, but uh, we can only have a certain amount of points with them. But these used to be good if you put them onto uh, the Outriders because they had that if you get attacked, you can get a retreat, but they haven't got that anymore. So that's not really a good uh, unit to put it on. It's probably a Tully Cav, probably than the best. Especially with having Sentinel. Sentinel's a, a good ability to have. It's something you've really got, got to keep your eye out for if you're going to attack a unit in long range of the of the unit and these guys move forward. Inclu- including myself and people have done it. Sometimes within tournaments or something, even a friendly game, you're, um, you sometimes pick up triggers and that's the, that's the hard I'm trying to remember all the triggers because there's a lot going on in the game at one point. And, not, and 
it might go oh like two two turns later oh i've got to trigger sentinel well obviously it's too far gone then but it's just from trying to remember your triggers and stuff and sentinel can be good because like like you said before with um uh, with bran and hodor the the, the dial if they had sentinel that means they would get a free maneuver which would be a lot better for it and then I'd see this guy. I'd definitely say that was C play. Yeah, no, I agree, man. I totally agree. Um, uh, next up, we have one of the newest commanders for House Stark, Rickard Carstark, Lord of Carhold. Um, so he comes with the affiliation House Carstark. So this unit is a House Carstark unit, which helps with his uh, tactic card triggers. He has superior numbers. So this unit's melee attacks may re roll any attack dice when attacking enemies with fewer remaining ranks. And he comes with Fuel by Slaughter. So after this unit completes a melee attack, if the defender suffered any wounds, this unit restores one wound plus one additional wound for each of the defender's destroyed ranks. And he comes with Cast Dark Retribution, a need for vengeance and taunt. Um, yeah, Ricard Cast Dark, you mentioned earlier that you quite enjoyed him as commander. Yeah, I've, I've played with him recently and I really enjoyed them. I put him in the Jumbo Great Axes and he worked well with them. I, um, because with the Grease Axis, you're bound to take someone down a rank or two with the with all their abilities and stuff like that. And I think Fuel by Slaughter is another good ability in the game, being able to heal. And that doesn't mean um, it says deal, once you restore one wound plus one additional wound for each of the defenders destroyed ranks. That doesn't mean once every rank you destroy, you get one additional wound. It's when whatever ranks deep have already lost. So if you're attacking someone with two ranks missing, and you do one wound to them, even if they keep healing up, you're going to get three health back every time. Yeah. Which is which is we're going to make a unit unkillable. But um, fuel by is a really good ability. What like I said, once you've taken down the rank, then you start getting rerolls. And if you're engaged already and they've got less ranks than you, getting the rerolls. And some of the Rickard card cards after you cards he's got where you heal even more if you want to test the cards which is the cock stark retribution yeah yeah, yeah he's, got, he's got he's got some he's got some uh some some really good cards i'm not a big fan of taunts but it can it can be good i think the new version of taunt is a lot better than the old version i do like definitely definitely yeah um i quite like the, the, the token play around it but um i've not played enough of ricard to really know if it works within starks does, does it not work that well within starks in the taunt or well usually when they ever play the commander taunt's usually the first card or two that are put out you know it's like i don't want this round one if you, you don't need that it's not gonna it's not, i don't need that to like round three or something you know what i mean it's just it's just gonna be no use right now so unfortunately it gets binned i know with sansa you can bring it back but it's better cards to bring back than taunt but it, it can be effective, and even if you know they're not going to charge you or they don't want to charge you, it's just being able to get those condition tokens on again. Yeah, well, if the things like, um, yeah, I mean, we'll go into more detail in the tactics deck deep dive when we do it, but things like um, forcing someone or well, asking someone to charge you when they know they want to charge your bruises instead and then making them weakened is... um. It's really good, especially if you're going to run things like Counter Strike into them. Yeah, really nice commander, mate. And I, I love the miniature for Ricard Carstark. He, li- he, he yeah, it's, it's nice. Yeah, he literally looks as you imagine how Stark to be, the North to be, just one really grim, <laughs> grizzled, grizzled <laughs> stuff. Um, <laughs> Northerner. How I look, <laughs> <laughs> mate. If you don't come to the next tournament dressed up as Ricard Carstark, <laughs> I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> Um, next up, Mage Mormon, uh, Lady of Bear Island, which is unfortunately how I look. Um, <laughs> the F- so she, <laughs> she comes with the affiliation, House Mormon, so this is a House Mormon unit, and she comes with the new version of Battle Scars that was um, updated in the Season 4 update. So this, and I hope you, I'll, I'll see what you think in a minute, but I'm sure you'll agree, this is a, such a better version of Battle Scars, because each time this unit performs a melee attack, before rolling attack dice, choose one. For each destroyed rank in this unit, choose plus one. And the three options are Vicious, Reroll Attack Dice, and the, re, uh, the unit rolls its highest attack dice value. Again, something that we've both spoken about in this episode, that you know, rolling your highest attack dice value when you're Starks and your last rank can be really good. Now, I love this version. And she comes with Sustained Assault. Here we stand and support Bear Island. So quite nice um, defensive, um, defensive grindy card. So it lets, it lets us stay in the game a bit longer. Um, I love this version of Battle Scars. I spoke about it in the Season 4 update video. But the fact that it's, again, it's the same principle as Overrun. So you're, regardless of the situation, 
you're getting something from that ability. So you can choose one all the times. You know, you're not relying on being attacked like you used to be, which is fine if you're in a, in a unit that can tank hit. Go on, so, oh, I'm rambling. Go on, mate. You talk, talk to me about Mage Mormont. Do, do you rate her as a commander? Yeah, I've played. That was the first commander I played. Obviously, you've got to try all the new stuff when the updates happen. And I did try it, and the new version of Battle Scars is a lot better than the old version because most people just didn't attack it because they knew what they'd start getting stronger, so what's the point? So that unit would just get ignored, and then it'd be just a wasted unit, especially if it was a good unit you had it in. Uh, when, I run, when I ran it, uh, I ran it into the Cockstark Spearman, just to, give, just to give the bit more of a threat, because obviously you've got to hold your line and stuff, but um, the cards are quite good, especially here we stand. I, I like the updated version of that, because the old version, it was when you're about to die. So you have to keep it in your hand, but now you can play it out your hand, which means you can have more tactics cards in your hand now instead of having to hold on to cards that you might might not use. And the, yeah, I think overall she's a good commander, and I think at the moment she's getting a lot of play. Definitely, especially battle cards. It's a really it's a well improved and it's a lot better now. Yeah, I think at, at current. So we're recording this in. Um... 16th of February, uh, February uh, 2024, and I think at the moment, it's, I believe she's the top rate commander on the Song of Ice and Fire stats. I think it is definitely because she is she is new, like updated, and there is like a kid with sweets. You got to try, you know, you got to have, try, have a bit, you know what I mean? Will she be get taken to tournaments? Possibly, more than likely, but will she play, be played over Umber? Probably not. But but she's definitely definitely um, like I said, depending on who you're playing against and what your lists are, because you don't want to take two of the same lists would tell me you want to take two different lists so it's a bit more of a variant and depending on what you're playing into it could be good I yeah I, I do rate her as a commander she, is a, she has improved quite a lot the cards are still the same but uh, her commander cards definitely improved yeah definitely mate I agree 100% so that's the end of the commanders then so just to summarise again it's a nice rich varied landscape of commanders there but so d- what are the two, com- two commanders you would take in a list pair into a tournament uh, Umber and um, Eddard. They're the two that have always talked to tournaments. Now, I'm going to be playing with other stuff until my next tournament. Well, it's, it's always nice to be forced to play with something new. We tend to uh, get, get, that's where you sort of find them, them new little, little little decent gems that you might not find. Yeah, so we'll, so we'll crack on with the NCUs then. So on, on screen now, we have the ladies of House Stark. Uh, Catelyn's, all these are four point NCUs. You have Catelyn Stark, Lady of Winterfell, Family, Duty, Honour. So it's got an influence ability. When its unit claims a zone, attach this card to a combat unit until the end of the round. Each time Catelyn influences a unit, remove one condition token from them. While influencing a unit, that unit attacks using its highest attack die value. Then we have Sansa Stark, Little Bird. Repeating the words, once per game, when Sansa activates, you may return one tactics card from your discard pile to your hand. Uh, she also has each time Sansa claims a zone, you may replace that zone's effect with return one tactics card from your discard pile to your hand. And Arya Stark, the wolf girl, never do what they expect. Arya begins the game with two order tokens on her. At the start of any enemy turn, you may remove one order token from Arya. If you do, target one friendly infantry unit. It performs one manoeuvre or retreat action. So there's a lot to take in here with these free NCUs. I know Catelyn's quite a bit, Catelyn and Sands are quite big uh, House Stark picks. But one by one, Steve, do you want to take us through these these guys? Or they talk, these girls? <laughs> yeah, um, well, Catelyn's um, nine times out of ten, she's in your list. Because being able to get the highest attack dice, even if you're on lower ranks, or even if you put it in Berserkers, when all the, the, the new Ravengers, which I haven't played yet, just putting it on them, getting the highest attack dice when you've got full ranks is always strong. But also one thing that she brings to the table, which is really good and strong, is remove one condition token, yeah. which I think is a really good ability, especially when people's trying to put weakened on your tully cap and you're like, no, you're not, get away. <laughs> <laughs> Sansa, obviously, depending on your commander, you want to bring back certain cards, your commander cards, possibly, like Berserk Tactics. <laughs> but, uh, but you can bring back any cards, but she is really, she is yeah. quite powerful in itself, and she does get played quite a lot, and she's in a lot of my, lot of my lists as well. And Arya Stark, that's, once again, manipulating the battlefield with your being able to get free 
maneuver or retreat action. That's even good if you start a round engaged with an infantry unit and you think they're going to take the swords that started their round. Nope, I would rather have you activate so I can use the swords. And, it for, and then you can get the unit to retreat and it forces your, your opponent to do something different on their turn. But not only that, but you can um, just get a free maneuver, potentially getting a good flank on someone that could be powerful. Yeah. But you've got to like you got to use that very tactically because you only get two. Yeah, I, I think you you actually be spot on all four of these, all three of these, mate. You um, also you you know the faction really well. But I think you are right. I think Catelyn that the, the removing the condition tokens really strong. Um, I've also the the Sansa once per game ability, which allows you to to when she activates, so you can activate, pull out sword orders, and then take the swords and then play it. Yes, I've done that many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's called being starked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Arya, I never realised how good Arya was until I actually played her. Um, so I was I sort of dismissed it quite stupidly, really. I slept on that quite a bit, and then. I took her just to, I think it was just to unlock um, Serial Pharrell one one game. And um, yeah, I, it's just crazy because you start the turn, you, you know you're going to get charged or you can see the other guys about to charge in a flank. And it's just being able to just spin a move or just even just move forward an inch and turn so you're out of the charge arc. It's it's really good. And yeah, as you just mentioned, fleeing out of combat so they can't take the swords. It's also good for um, when someone uses the uh, outflank on you. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, so yeah, three really good NCUs there. Next up, we have the season four version of Roger Cassell. So he's got Mar- so again all four point NCUs. With the season four update, we see see quite a lot of the NCUs pre brought down to four points, which is quite nice because it, it really does it gives you options because you're not restricted by the points cost anymore. It's just sort of what do you want to play into into your army. So Roger Cassell, combat veteran, martial expertise. So each time Roger claims swords, target one enemy combat unit, they become vulnerable. Decent. Roger begins the game with two order tokens on him. Each time a friendly combat unit is performing a melee attack, after rolling attack dice, you may remove one order token from Roderick. If you do, the attacker may re-roll any attack dice. That's really cool for being able to charge across like bogs and stuff. You make sure you get the re-rolls. Lion of Mormon, youngest she bear. Now, Lion is one of the ones I've been really enjoying playing because you, you tend to lose units in Starks. Well, I tend to because I'm not very good at the game. But, <laughs> um, but getting that critical blow in Tully Cav, oof, it's mustard. Chef kiss. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fantastic. There's an influence ability. So when this unit claims his own, attach his card to a combat unit until the end of the round. While influencing a friendly unit, it gains the following based on the number of destroyed friendly combat units. Effects are cumulative. So if you haven't, haven't got any destroyed units... The unit she influences gain plus one to morale tests. If you have one destroyed unit, your melee attacks gain critical blow. If you have two destroyed units, you become Lannister's worst nightmare and automatically pass all panic tests. And on the three plus, you may reroll any attack dice. So that's four points, and I really do enjoy using her as an NCU. An and uh, finally, Howl and Reed, Protector of the Neck. So this is an update to Season 4 change as well. So Hunter's Guile is gone down to four points, as discussed. Uh, the Influence ability again. Uh, when its unit claims a zone, attach this card to a combat unit until the end of the round. While influencing an enemy unit, they treat all terrain as having the hindering keyword. While influencing an enemy unit, when that unit performs a melee attack before resolving the action, you may remove this card from that unit. If you do, that attack suffers minus one to hit. Now, the change in Season 4 was that this became a one-use-only influence thing rather than before it used to be every single used to attach to the, to the whole round. But it has dropped the point, did it, though? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I, I think it is fair for four points. Um, but yeah, do you want to go through these NCUs and give us your opinion on how you're using them? Yeah, well, Roderick is uh, quite good. I've been using that um, NCU as well in a couple of my lists. And when you take the swords, being able to give, like, once again, another condition token is really powerful. But I like the ability with the two order tokens, being able to re-roll that dice. But I like the wording where it says, after rolling attack dice, you don't have to declare it beforehand, because you might charge over a bug, like you said, you roll your attack dice and you don't get re-rolls, but you might all hit. Yeah. But if it's before attack dice, then that would be a wasted a bit, that would be a wasted order. So I like the way it's after the attack dice, which is quite powerful. And also it means when you're engaged as well, you get that re-rolls. Yeah. 
Um, Lily Ann Bogans, uh, she is, I like her. Um, in, it's the thing with the Starks at the moment, they've got loads of good NCUs, and which one is there to take? I'd love to take about four or five of them, because they've got all the different abilities, but obviously you can't attach them all. And, but I do like Lily Ann, because when like a combat, like it says a combat unit, so that means a die wolf as well. If that dies, yeah, you get the plus one. She so wears the North Remembers on the actual card. It's when an infantry or cavalry unit. She so don't remember a wolf, <laughs> so <laughs> that doesn't trigger off that. <laughs> but a crit blow does, and I have, have had crit blow on the Tully Cav once before, and I think it done. 14 and 15 hits, yeah, and it basically one shot the unit, and it is brilliant, yeah. But, but obviously, once again, you've got to roll all sixes, and sometimes that you, you don't even roll past three. How and read, I've never used the old version, I probably had to give this a go, but like you said, it's been nerfed with the being able to use the minus one to hit. Now, some units only get to hit once per game, anyway, yeah, and depending on what your what abilities like if they got weakened or something like that you might or you they're attacking someone who's got disrupt they might not need to use that or if they attack someone who's got disrupt agile and then you use that that's minus three to hit <laughs> so that could be a uh, interesting well that's 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 a king's guard hitting on fives and then you got disrupt and counter strike <laughs> <laughs> and you weakened uh all the abilities that could actually proc off each other off each other but um yeah i think it's a uh, Bring it down to four points. I think you probably will get play, but I think, like you said, not being not being being able to only use it once, where most units only attack once, possibly twice around, depending on who goes first in that round. And yeah, I'm sure whoever uses it's going to use it wisely, and not just put it on someone that's in off the off the battlefield. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, so again, another strong set of NCUs there. Next up, we have um, uh, well, we have our more costly stuff. So um, we've got uh, both versions of Eddard Stark and Rob Stark the NCU. So we've got Eddard Stark, Warden of the North. Now this guy is six points, one of the, the last remaining six point NCUs. Bravery in the face of death. Eddard begins the game with four order tokens on him. Each time a friendly unit is performing a panic test after rolling a dice, you may remove one order token from Eddard. If you do, that unit may re-roll any dice for this test. Also, each time a friendly unit passes a panic test, you may remove one order token from Eddard. If you do, that unit restores two wounds plus one wound for each of its destroyed ranks. We'll come back to this because this one's a re- uh, quite a heavily uh, uh, conversation piece because I really, really think this guy is, is powerful. Um, the next version, Eddard Stark, Hand of the King. So this is five points. Price of Honor. At the start of any turn, you may destroy Eddard. If you do, target one enemy NCU. That NCU cannot activate and loses all abilities until the end of the round. And also, as a second ability, Hands Orders. This is an influence. So when this unit claims his own, attacks his card to a combat unit until the end of the round. While influencing a unit, each time that unit is targeted by an NCU ability or tactic zone, you may cancel the effect of that NCU or zone. Um, and also we have Rob Stark, King in the North, Wolf's Cunning. This is a four-point NCU. After deployment, target one friendly combat unit, remove it from the battlefield, placing it off the table in reserve. Once per game, when Rob claims the horses, you may replace that zone's effect with deploy the unit Rob placed in reserve, fully in short range of any flank table edge, and attach this card to them until the end of the game. While attached, enemies that's that unit successfully charged in a flank or rear become panicked and vulnerable, and it cannot be included in an army that includes Eddard Stark because this is at the point where Rob has become King in the North. The King in the North! Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you in a minute, but my personal opinion is, so some of the standout things here is Eddard Stark, that healing is horrendously good in... A Tully Cav army or just any army really that six points I think is really well spent on him um, and also it's just worth mentioning that the Eddard Stark Hand of the King the the blocking influences and the NCU abilities or sorry the NCU abilities or tactic zones is for every single ability like it, you don't target and then take him off like you would do Barris and Selmy it's literally everything and NCU abilities includes things like um, Varys's tokens and Rob Stark 
Uh, he's got basically the old version of Outflank, but with a sort of a, a, a wish version of Devastating Impact. But yeah, I'll let you talk about these guys, man. I've got my opinion. I could talk about Ed Old Stark all day because, you know, I'm a big, big Boromir fan. But <clears throat> yeah, what do you think of um, the, this lineup? Yeah, um, well, I use Ed Ard as a commander, so I don't usually get a chance to play these as NCUs. But the, the 6.1, it does get a lot of play. I do see it, and being able to re-roll your panic when you failed is strong, especially against Lannister. Yeah. Or any, against anyone, really, if you fail it, and you, you desperately need to stay alive. And if you pass a panic test, being able to, like, if you're on the last rank and you, you're about to lose your last wound, and you pass a panic test, next week you can heal four wounds. That's next week you're up to two ranks, and you, like, you're not going to die then for a while. That's, uh, that's quite strong. But obviously, once you've got four order tokens, you've got to use them wisely. But if you don't use them properly or don't use them when needed, then it'll be a waste of six points. There's a lot to spend on to an NCU. Yeah. But it's definitely worthwhile, especially with Planet Test. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I see him play quite a lot with uh, Tully Cav. Because when Tully Cav, obviously, if, if they are, if Tully Cav were on the last rank and you, know, you pass that Planet Test, then it, it, it loads of stuff happens. So you get the, you essentially heal. Uh, was it three, five wounds? You heal five wounds with the Winterfell Guard in there as well, and Rally Banner, and you deal one wound, and that's that's a hell of a package to be uh, dealing out as you were uh, just for being hit. Yeah, yeah. I do one wound to you. Uh, I do one wound to you. Oh, with the next week you heal five, nearly on full rank, and uh, <laughs> and then I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on my last legs because just took a wound. <laughs> <laughs> a very dangerous whack a mole. Um, Edward Stark. The Hand of the King. Yep. Now, I, I've not played with this at all, but I've watched some people, some people's streams where they've used it and stuff like that. And it is very interesting, and I am tempted to use it myself, because if you're engaged with someone, and you, you activate them first and maybe take the bags and you leave swords open, you know they're going to use swords on that unit that it's engaged with, and you just use it after blocker, can't you? Yeah. You could put Eddard on, like, swords, for instance, or an ability on the NCU board, and he's activated, and then you've got one activation left, they've got an activation left on the NCU, started their turn, you could kill Eddard yeah. to stop them, block them from using their last activation, which then frees up that zone, so then so that um, zone's open again for you to activate your NCU to put on some. Yeah. Which could be, could be good, because it says at the start of any turn, it doesn't say if he hasn't activated, you can destroy him. It means that you'd use them first and then destroy them, so you get the best of both worlds. Yeah. Is that extra, extra activation over someone on on a certain turn? Maybe it's something that you'd use probably round five or six, not something you'd use early. Because it would be just a waste of five points, and plus you'd be an activation down, and activations are very powerful in this game. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's some 3D chess stuff right there, mate. I think I'll try that on my next list, maybe. And Rob Stark, I have used this um, this NCU before, mainly to bring quite a few Tully Cav, <laughs> so I can get a, a wolf in there, <laughs> as well for that extra activation. Uh, but the good thing is, with this ability, is I know you have to take the horses to bring the outflank on, for this for this uh, ability, but the good thing is you set up your your army how you want it to be, and they could set up to counter the way you've set up. And next minute you use that to use that ability to take off one of your powerful units to be able to go from behind and like oh no I set up to try and stop that from happening and from t- to try and defend against that, but now it's going to come from a different way. So then it's kind of like once again manipulates the board. I mean I, I think it is a good ability. So yeah, best the uh, best the yeah, end of a. Uh... A start over you, mate. So yeah, we we managed to get through it. It's only taken us a uh, a few hours, but it's um it's been good, mate. It's, it's been enjoyable. I've been really looking forward to having this conversation with you because you know I've, you know we've we've sort of crossed paths quite a few times in the tournament scene, and you've always been running starts when I've when I've seen you playing them. So it made sense to me to have you have you on here to talk about starts because you know you played them through through the good times and the bad times. Um, so it's it's, it's been nice sort of talking to you and getting you getting your opinion on on this stuff and uh yeah I look forward to seeing you run in the past and eventually win the tournament with um Yeah hopefully win the tournament with Starks yeah. Well, well thanks for having me as well. Um uh, really do appreciate that you picked me out to everyone to talk about Starks and hopefully it gives some insights to people or people that's new to the game or 
veterans to the game, you know, like maybe, oh, I didn't see that that way, and you know, little combos and things. And that's just my take on the on the faction. And obviously, my opinion is completely different to everyone else's. So what works for me might not work for anyone else. But it's also good to try new stuff and enjoy the game. Really, it's done exactly that, Steve. Because I've been I've been talking to you in this, and there's stuff that I haven't really picked up on that you pointed out to me. So it's been it's been good for that conversation. So you know, if if I win the next tournament with Starks, then you can take credit. For it. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can take credit for it. It's yours. Yours. <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, um, before you go, what I will just say to you is, what activation count do you think Starks work at their best? Seven or eight, I think. You can the maximum you can run is a nine. The recent counts, and with the most of the units being five points now, uh, some good units you can run that more than running three wolves. Because I think years ago, ages ago, you used to you run three wolves to get nine activation counts, or at least two of them anyway. But I think eight's a good good list, but. The more activations you have, the better it is, but you're kind of not getting as the powerful stuff on the board. So at the moment, I've been running seven activation lists, and they've been quite strong. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, cheers for that, that conversation, Steve. I really do appreciate it. And, um, yeah, I look forward to having you back for the Tactics Deck Deep Dive, and I hope we'll go through some of the cards in more detail to give you know newer listeners, newer people to the game, an idea of how to play the cards and where the triggers, the clashing triggers, and... What I'm quite looking forward to is running through some of these commanders with you and really get an idea of the card play, t- play style for them as well. Sounds good. Is there anything you'd like to add before we uh, we wrap up for the for the conversation? No, I think that's everything. I think um, I think this is brilliant that you're actually doing this, and uh, it's good for the community to get an in depth of like the depth faction itself. And uh, I think it's brilliant what you're doing, and keep it up. Oh, thank you. And especially um, if you ever get to play against Grant or even see Grant in the tournament or in the dive, he's, he's a fantastic guy and uh, he's painting phenomenal. He is brilliant. And he's got some YouTube videos out there as well if you're ever curious about how to paint stuff and do stuff because I've actually followed some stuff myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad you're very helpful. I, I just enjoy painting stuff. So always, man. I really do appreciate the, your kind words. It's, um, yeah, I think what, what really does does draw me to this game is the community the community has always been really really positive i mean i know there's been some ups and peaks and troughs in the game but that you know characters such as yourself are really what holds this game up for me and uh keeps me interested in playing new people and in running new tournaments so uh, again thank you for that but um yeah that's it for our for our stark um faction overview so keep your eyes peeled for the next one and uh i'll speak to you soon take care steve bye now so there we go, guys. That is the end of our first episode of a Song of Ice and Fire Faction Overview series for House Stark. So again, a massive thank you to Stephen for his time. Um, he really does know the faction inside now. And as, as I said at the beginning, he's he's played the guys through the through the good times and the bad, and rode on the back of the uh, a Song of Ice and Fire roller coaster as House Stark struggles to find their place. And obviously, we both believe that they're in a in a much better place at the moment. So keep your ears to the ground. There will be some more of these um, faction overview series coming out with some more um, community alumni. I thank you for taking the time to check out this video. Please do like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying the content. And yeah, leave us a comment in the section below if you've got any of your own ideas of how to use how Stark, if we've missed anything, or maybe you found something you can use in your games and it's working well for you. Just leave us a comment in the section below and we'll make sure that we come back to every single one of them. So have a great day. You take care. I'll speak to you soon.